Today is February 20th, 2015, and my name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Sue Verhoff, the senior archivist here at the History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. J David Johnston, who served in the U.S. Marine Corps during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Mr. Johnston's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans Oral History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Johnston, and we would like to thank you for participating in the project. Would you begin by telling us your full name and your current address? Sure. Um, my name is David McLean Johnston, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Tell us a little bit about uh, growing up, where you grew up, and, and how you got into the military. Sure. Um, I'm pretty unique in that I'm actually born and raised in Atlanta. I know most people immigrated here, so, um, but I grew up sort of downtown, um, mid midtown area, Ansley Park, sort of, I'd say middle class area at the time, and um, pretty standard upbringing, went to school around here, um, and when I hit high school, uh, I actually chose to go to boarding school in Tennessee to do something a little different and um, really enjoyed that and kind of went up there and it was nice to be a little bit away from family just to sort of get those teenage angst years separate so it was always a, a good thing to see my family. Um, but I guess uh, in terms of what took me from that to being in the military is um, like I wasn't the best performer in high school um, and but I went to um, Boston University for college to again try something completely different and I probably shouldn't have done college I probably that probably wasn't the right route for me but social pressures and everyone tells you you got to go to college so yeah. so I uh, went up there and did a couple years and it never really set with me so I did uh, I decided to take a year off and kind of had worked a uh, minimum wage job for the area in a liquor store slinging beer kegs and things like that so um, pretty hard labor and and uh, it kind of always worked but I'd never never done it full-time like that and sort of realized what it's like to be at the bottom of the barrel in terms of uh, of jobs and um, when it came time to decide whether I wanted to go back to school I, I really didn't want to go um, but I, I didn't want to float anymore and I guess I'd I would describe my um, behavior until then probably as a slacker so you know I, I liked to to skate and do what was easy and you know tough tough choices I didn't you know I'd take the easy way out so um, so I kind of I had kind of always thought about some some sort of military as a kid but it's I think it's a little more romantic in thought as a child you know I, I wanted to be a fighter pilot but you know, Don't my, my 2.5 GPA sort of stopped that in its tracks. And so um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I came back to Atlanta. I, I moved back to town uh, in retreat and sort of um, lived with my folks again. And I can remember, um, you know, they I worked at a photo lab in a drugstore, you know, another sort of simple job. And I can remember I had a Saturday off and I was sleeping in on the Saturday. And um, my old man came in and sort of ripped me out of the bed at 10.30 in the morning and said, you know, you're not just going to sit here all day. You need to go do something. And I, I think they had ideas in their head about, you know, friends, children who'd done this or that. So they said, we'd like you to go go talk to an Air Force recruiter or a Navy recruiter and see what they have to offer. And I, I've, in hindsight, they were probably thinking of what would still kind of be the easy way out for me that I, I might be likely to do, but I guess I was, you know, a little steam that Saturday morning, so I said, okay. So I left the house and I went straight to the Marine Corps recruiter, and I actually, I ended up in uh, in an admin office. I, I didn't go to the right place, and so I'm, I'm probably lucky I didn't get shot coming in the door, but I think I found the ROTC director or something for Atlanta, and she immediately got on the phone with a recruiter gave me the address and said, I'm sending you as what well. I'm sending him your way. So I kind of had a Saturday chat with a recruiter and, you know, they bless their hearts. They, they fast track you. So I kind of waffled on the point about what I wanted to do. And they said, well, you know, come back next week and let's talk some more. 
So what was your parents' reaction when you told them you joined the Marine Corps? Uh, they, they were a little surprised. I guess they knew I'd talked to a Marine Corps recruiter. And then uh, the, the fast track trick some more is that when I went back for that second visit, we actually went to the, the, the entry, uh, the MEPS program. I can't even remember what MEPS is, but you know, that's where they process you in. Right. And uh, so went down there and did the physical and everything else. And they said, well, here's the paper. Are you going to sign it today or, or what? So I said, yeah, why not? What else am I going to do? Um, so Were you alone? Did any of you? Did I didn't you know anybody you? else around. Okay. I mean, I knew, I knew the recruiter from the week before, and that's about it. So as far as my folks knew, I went to, to have another chat with a recruiter, and I came home that night and said, uh, well, I got some big news for you. I signed up to join the Marine Corps, and I'm going to be in the infantry. What um, year was this? This would have been 2003. Okay. Summer of 2003, and uh, I, I, my, I, they were ecstatic. I think that there was some direction in sight, so they they were pleased with that. And uh, you know, I kind of, I guess my my approach for going to the Marine Corps is that you know, I, like I said, I kind of half-assed it up till then, and I just thought here's a chance to change that, and so I uh, just thought I'd aim for the top and see if I could do it. So. Um, so it was interesting. When did you go to Paris Island? I, I was, I guess I signed up in July and I, they must have thought I was pretty stable because they slated me for October. So I had three months to think about it. So, and then uh, I, I can remember the, uh, when, I, when I told my folks what I was doing, I guess my mother, my, my, my dad got it, my mother didn't get it. And I'll never forget, she, uh, we were having dinner and so she said, well, well what's the infantry do? And before I could even say anything, my, my old man says, Jan, they're the ones that go kill people. So I said, oh, that's great. But I watched the blood, you know, drop out of her face. But, uh, but it was 03, so, you know, there was already a lot going on. So I think that probably scared her a little bit. But, yeah, I um, imagine. At least the, the force. So what was your impression upon your arrival at uh, Paris Island? What, what am I doing here? <laughs> I think that's everybody's first impression, and um, you know, I guess up until then, it's it's a little surreal, and then when you get there, it's it's still surreal, but it's but you know it's real, and you know, from this point forward, anything you do is is quitting. So if you decide you want to leave anyway, you know, you can either do it or you can quit, but it, you can't just. It's not. A, I guess the feeling of walking away before that would be a little different, whereas once you're there, you know. You're either going to see it through. You've or, made the commitment. Right. Yes. Right. So uh, I, I can remember the, uh, we, I went in a van from Atlanta to Paris Island. I guess it's too close to fly you. And uh, I was a smoker at the time, and I remember just trying to smoke as many cigarettes as I could before we got there. And uh, we, we got in an accident right outside of Atlanta, just a little, you know, bumper tap, but, you know, just to add trauma to the situation. And so uh, I was pretty well disoriented by the time we got there. And I'm absolutely certain they want it to be that way for you because, you know, it's it was uh, right at dusk and pull up and all of a sudden you got drill instructors everywhere and, you know, they don't have those in the real world. So it was, uh, it was a, I, I, I certainly won't forget it, so. Did you have to stand on the yellow footprints? Absolutely. And I, the drill instructor, I, you know, I'd seen the videos of the drill instructor coming on the bus, and we were in a van. So I thought, well, what are they going to do? But he, he didn't have any problem getting right into the van to tell us what to do. So um, you know, they rush you out on the footprints and going through the whole process. And, you know, they're sharks with blood in the water, so there's drill instructors floating around everywhere. And like I said, I smoked, and so, you know, the drill instructors could smell it on you. So they'd say, you're, you're never going to make it. You're not going to make it through here because I bet you want a cigarette right now, don't you? And so, you know, yeah. But I quickly forgot that I even smoked. You know, there's there's almost no time to care about it. I think it was the easiest experience of, of quitting smoking that you could go through is that uh, you don't have time to miss it. So um, they keep you pretty busy. So so how long a period was your recruit training? Um, I did the, I, I made it through, straight through, so thir 13 weeks. Um, I didn't get, didn't have problems with any of the qualifications. So um, that, I think that was the standard amount. So 
but um, it, it was rough. And I mean, in hindsight, it's not rough, but that's because they're getting you ready for worse. So, but I, you know, it's hard to be away and it's hard to, they, they take away all your time from you. So the time you have to write letters home and do this and that ends up being 10 or 15 minutes at best. So some of that's nice because you don't think about it too much, but mm -hmm. they, they almost kill you with boredom and mundane tasks, but that, that's the point, so. Were your parents able to come down for graduation? They did, they did. And our, ours was a little wrecked. We had an indoor graduation because it was early, early January or late December. So bad weather, hmm. they didn't want to do it on the parade deck. So we, you know, sat in a gymnasium and, and did it there, which, which was fine, you know. What was, was their reaction to graduate? <laughs> when <laughs> they saw you? So I, I can, uh, when they saw me, I guess I didn't see them, you know, there's all kinds of families and their yeah. drill instructors are still running you around. But, uh, you know, I guess the way they did it when I was there is that um, that's sort of the first family days, they come out and look and then they, they give you your, your Eagle Globe and Anchor, which is huge. And, um, and then when that's over, they let, let your families come to you. And uh, my, my mother was in tears. And she said, I, I didn't even recognize you. But, you know, it kind of, kind of stands to reason. We've all got bald heads and are wearing the same uniform. But I'm sure that mattered to her more than me. But uh, they were proud. They were Great. glad. So where did you go from there? Um, I went to Camp Lejeune, Camp, uh, Camp Geiger first, to do um, infantry training battalion. So... Um, I can't remember how long that was, but you know, worse worse than Paris Island. I think I marked my whole approach to fleet. The uh, the mentality I had the whole way was I just kind of said I, I don't want to be the one to quit. So I don't want to be the first one to quit. So I I kind of just tried to stay somewhere in the middle. You know, I I didn't have any expectation that I'd be the best, but just didn't want to be the worst. So I kind of held on with that mentality, but I also had it, had the little devil in the back of my head that said, if it gets any harder, I'm out of here. But of course it got harder every day, but I never left because I, I just didn't want to give up on it. So um, I can, School of Infantry was uh, 10 times as difficult. And I think, uh, I don't think they had any rules around School of Infantry at the time, at least that were. Tell us a little bit about the School of Infantry and what that was like. <sighs> um, you know, it's a lot like Paris Island, but it's not, it at least then wasn't under as much scrutiny. So I think the keeping you awake rules, I, I think at Paris Island, they have to give you eight hours of sleep, but maybe that didn't apply at, at uh, School of Infantry. So very little sleep, lots of strenuous uh, exercise. You know, they're not, they're not just trying to keep you in shape. They're actually trying to stress you out at that point. So, um, you know, I think our first morning run was a, a boots and utilities run. And it was about three miles, and I'm pretty sure that we just sprinted the whole way. You know, I, it was one thing to jog. It was another to, to not be able to keep up even when I was trying my hardest. So, um, and that was just kind of the beginning. But Well, how old were you at this point? Uh, I was the old man of the unit because I was 22 or 23. Okay. You know, everybody's 18, and I was a, a little bit older. So, um, yeah, it would have been, been 22. I mean, not... not now and I and know not too smoker. old, but then you know I felt like the old guy because right. these kids right out of school have are in great shape. So. Did were you afforded liberty? Were you able to go out in town? Uh, yeah, I think it was a few weeks in. They start giving you liberty from school of infantry, and you could either stay and be tortured on the weekend because they always had instructors around. So I know I'd you know get off base and just go stay in a hotel just to not have to deal with that. Um, it was worth whatever, you know, I think it was the Triangle Motor Lodge was 20 bucks a night or something. So it was worth $20 to sleep in a, probably a dirty bed, but away from that. So, and you know, you don't, you quite care about a dirty bed once you've been in school. It's just the for quiet. A while. Yeah. Enjoying the quiet. And dirt's yeah. no problem. But um, yeah, and I, I, I don't think I ever really did anything exciting out in town other than, than sleep, really. I mean, that's what, uh, what mattered most of the time. Well, so. Usually service towns don't have very much to do. Right. Yeah, I think uh, 
So, so tattoo, tattoo parlors, barber shops, and strip clubs. That's what somebody described Jacksonville, North Carolina to me. And I, th I, you know, I, have, I know a lot of people probably love Jacksonville, but I think it's a pretty accurate description too. So, um, but, uh, so when you finished the, uh, the, uh, the training there, uh, did you get leave or did you on to your next duty station? You know, I can't remember if I had leave. Um, I, I want to say probably not. I think I went straight to my assignment. <clears throat> you know, I think you burn all the days you accrue at Paris Island. You get 10 or 14 days after that, and that's more than you've earned, so you're kind of in the hole. Right. And I think after School of Infantry, you just... I, I I don't remember having any time to enjoy myself between School of Infantry and hitting fleet, and um, and and that was I think it was fine by the end of that. You know. So where where was your first duty station? I went to um, I went to Second Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion, Second LAR, and I was in uh, Alpha Company, um, and I and that's who I deployed with at first. So I. I went to School of Infantry and I, I ended up being really glad that my recruiter, I, I was very adamant that I wanted to be an 0311, a, a rifleman. And he said, no, no, I'm going to do, you know, we'll do 0300 and then that way you can pick your designation while you're at School of Infantry. And, and what I learned really is that means they pick for you, but at least you think you get to pick. Um, but I, I did well on testing and whatnot and so I ended up becoming a tow gunner, which um, that's a uh, anti-tank missileman. So the the big plus there is you you ride around a lot because while it's technically a portable weapon, it's it's pretty heavy. They're not going to make anybody walk around with that for the most part. O only rarely did I ever do that um, with that weapon system. But uh, my knees really were starting to bother me at School of Infantry, and so I was really glad that I got put in a place that. Um, I certainly walked plenty while I was in, but uh, maybe I missed a few walks that would have been a little harder on me than, than I wanted to deal with. So. Well, how long were you um, at the Second Line Infantry Battalion before you deployed? Um, you know, I probably got there March or April of '04, and we deployed in September. And I, I yeah, we deployed in September because we deployed on. We were on the plane on my birthday. So you flew over. So we flew over to uh, to, to Kuwait Which on my deployment. Deployed with the vehicles and right. the whole Ve battalion? Vehicles we put on trains to California and they shipped without us and then we met them in Kuwait. Did the battalion deploy or just Alpha? Just company? the company. Okay. We had, um, there was a company from 2nd LAR that we relieved I think the idea was to have one company at a time over there from each battalion, from each light armor recon battalion. And so we, <coughs> we relieved, you know, a sister, a sister company that was deployed. So how would you describe the mission of the light armored reconnaissance battalion or your company? Um, you know, the mission could be so different from what the reality was. I think we got used for a lot of things that were, the idea was that we we were sort of self-portable infantry, but they didn't want us to do, I, my experience w was that we were never used to do anything extremely strenuous, I because I think they felt we were a little, I, I think the stigma might have been they felt we were, weren't sure what we could do compared to uh, you know, an infantry regiment or or a whole battalion that might be deployed. So we we got to, uh, assigned to do you know a lot of sort of smaller missions that could be handled by a company-sized element, some you know midnight snatch and grab type stuff, or um, you know when they weren't sure what to do with us, we were certainly well armed. So we did a lot of sort of defensive positions and whatnot and things like that. A lot of mobile security too. Mm -hmm. So well having those wheels I guess made you a premium Yeah, and sometimes asset. it was to our benefit and sometimes it wasn't. And then being so the the light armored reconnaissance battalion is made up of light armored vehicles, LAVs. Most of them have the the turret with the twenty five millimeter cannon on it and then the 
the few in, in between were the ones with the tow missile systems, which is what I was on, and then a mortar team. So we were in a, a weapons platoon amongst the company. So we were kind of the stepchild of the stepchild. Um, so we, we got a lot of tasks that I wondered if it was just, we don't know what to do with you, so here's what it is. So I can, in particular, think of one, one snatch and grab that they wanted to do on a guy in the middle of the night. So the, the precursor to that was they said, well, weapons platoon guys, you guys are going to walk in 12 miles and set up a perimeter, and then we'll drive in and pick them up and go, and then you can walk back out. So we had however many miles to hump in with you know full gear, and then everybody drove in and kind of did their job. So their, their one-hour day was our, our full day and full night. So I, you know, and I, I don't resent that. Certainly, it, you know, it makes for great stories now. But uh, at the time, I remember my legs hurt. So you're you're the LAVs, light armored vehicles, are rubber tired as opposed to track. -tired. Right. So they have eight eight wheels, eight wheeled vehicles, and um, a lot less armor than a tank, for example. I think even less armor than uh, the Amtrak, the AAVs. And I guess the idea is that it's there's some armor there, and, but, but it really, the, at least in practice, the primary element was speed and, and a lot of power to be somewhere pretty quickly. Did, did, uh, was, was the LAV used to move troops around, or was it just, you know, the crew the, and... and the, the, the ones with the 25-millimeter cannon had space in the back for, for a fire team. So there would be a four-man fire team in the back, and then they'd have a gunner and a vehicle commander in the turret and then a driver in the front. Um, the tow, the, the LAV equipped for a tow missile system was, there, there's no, there's not supposed to be any extra ride along people. It's a driver, a vehicle commander, a gunner, and a loader. And that was, that was it. So um, for, the, for the majority of the deployment, I was a loader, which meant I sat in a bucket seat in the back with 20 or so tow missiles a few inches from my, my head, so. Well, what was your impression of Iraq when, or, or I guess Kuwait first and then later Iraq? Uh, Kuwait, I just, it just hot. We were there in September, so it was kind of the tail end of summer. Um, and, it, and it was hot almost to a, a torturous degree. Um, you know, we were, the idea was to acclimate. I think everybody got pretty well food poisoned on the airplane ride over. Um, we we stopped to pick up some food in a Eastern European country, and and uh, I think everybody kind of paid for it. So it was a hundred and whatever degrees, and everybody was sick and tired. And uh, you know, I can remember the way we did our tasks in Kuwait was to almost do four out, two four-hour sleep shifts, one in the middle of the night, but then one in the middle of the day because it was just too hot to do anything, or at least they didn't want to make us do anything. So, um, you know, we'd kind of do a six to ten, and then from ten to two, we'd stay inside, and then from two to six on the other side, or, or however long, go back out and sleep again at night. So. Did you have much interaction with any of the coalition forces or the Kuwaitis? Not really. I mean, we in Kuwait anyway. Not really. Um, I mean, we were on on a base. I think I think we were at Camp Victory in Kuwait, but um, we didn't interact with other units. We we went in. I can remember we did a range in Kuwait, um, which might be the hottest I've ever been in my whole life. Uh, I, I was a gunner in the turret of, you know, these dark armored vehicles with no air conditioner to speak of. And when you're firing on a range, you got to close all the hatches. So we were in a hot black box in the middle of the desert in the middle of the day. And I, I can only remember sweating so profusely that I'd, a I'd asked the loader at the time for a bottle of water. And they were these big liter and a half bottles of water, and it was just how quickly could I pour it in my mouth and drink it before I needed another one from him. And I, I probably didn't drink 12 bottles in 12 minutes, but it kind of felt like it. It was, uh, it was an. I I don't want to do that again. Yeah. That was an experience. So, but um, 
And, and then the real torture is at night, this cloud cover moves over, I guess. No, I don't know the science, but something atmospheric's going on. So as it cools down, you see these big clouds come in. And from from what I'd tell you from Georgia's experiences, it, it's going to rain. Here come these clouds. And it probably would, but, you know, the sun would come up just in time to cook them away before it ever rained. So no relief. always the threat of rain, and it never happened. So, yeah. But um, So how know, long were you in Kuwait? Just a week or two. It wasn't very long. And then, um, you know, our... Our destination, we we were going to Fallujah, which was a hotbed at that point, and, uh, and we, we we knew that we were well aware of that. Um, so we we'd met the the vehicles in Kuwait, which had been shipped, so they had to be serviceable again. So we pretty much got them ready, and when they were ready to go, we drove from Kuwait to well, you know up through Baghdad and on to Fallujah on a. So Baghdad was secure when this time? Uh, secure yeah. is... Uh... My my view of the driving was down in, in a hole, so I, I don't really know how deep into Baghdad we got, but I, if we we probably stayed on the outskirts if possible. Um, I don't think it was a, a real hotbed yet. I think Sadr City, which was a little on the outside, was, but that would have been the other way from where we were going. So, um, you know, I think they would... I'm sure if we could stay on the periphery, we would have done that because the goal wasn't to go go looking for trouble on our way to our destination. So who did you relieve? Who did your company relieve? So we were a, uh, Apache company, and we relieved Delta Company, and they, there was a one- or two-week overlap. Um, you know, I guess the the – interesting part i guess the mentality sort of leading up to it is actually when i went in the marine corps i never thought i'd end up going to iraq because i thought it was a done deal and i think everybody kind of did um you know i thought somewhere else was on the horizon from the talk of the time so um but never went anywhere else things heated back up in iraq and you know i think marines were pretty well out but they started sending marines back in to deal with some of these problem areas um and I know Delta Company got hit pretty pretty hard while they were there, um, learning learning the hard way, kind of what was going on. I, you know, road, roadside bombs were were the new thing, so it's kind of learning how how those were going to be used against us. And you know, those guys did the hard learning for us. Um, they had a lot to teach us when we got there. Um, I'm, I'm sa- I'm sorry that they had to learn the way they did, but um, so they did it. Did, would you say they did a good job of preparing you for what was ahead? Ah, uh, you know, I think so. I think the roadside bombs were the big, big deal, the big new issue. And and while you can mentally try to be ready for that, or have an expectation of that, it's people who can tell you exactly what to look for that that mattered most. You know, um, Part of what they said they had done, which I, I don't not believe them, but uh, the highway systems aren't, weren't terrible over there. So they had the highways around Fallujah were three lanes in each direction with a guardrail down the middle. And um, I think they were, you know, hiding artillery shells in the guardrail. And as the vehicle would drive past, they'd detonate the artillery shell. And a uh, Delta company had been a big part of tearing the guardrails down just tearing them down completely so there's nowhere to to hide it in the guardrail but you know some of the little lessons that they learned in in a really terrible way was um, you know don't turn around in the same place twice don't put grooves in the road you know you turn around the same place you set a pattern and that's where they put the next one so you know they let us know don't you know don't do that kind of thing and Stay on the road as much as you can. On the, I, I know you were in the interior of the vehicle, but mm-hmm. were you able to see any of the Iraqis in you know what kind of reception your uh, unit had, or your people, or your group, or coming up from Kuwait? Not, not really. Um, I didn't. I was in the back. Um, you know, to be honest, at the time I, I didn't know what to anticipate, so it was it was a scary deal. Now, you know, everything's in hindsight, and now it, that almost seems laughable. I don't really think there was any danger on the way up to speak of, but uh, I didn't know that. You know, I just knew we were in a place that all this stuff was happening. So, so I stayed 
stayed down in the hole happily. Um, you know, I, I guess a little in, intimidated at the unknown because you can't tell what's going on when you're in there, but happy to be behind a piece of steel. Um, you know, when we got, when we actually got to Fallujah and started running missions, we were definitely out and about. Um, and the reception was, I think, mixed. And I think my personal experience on it was that um, it seemed generally that people at the time were, were just tired of us more than anything else. And, you know, this is a city that had been a hotbed for a long time. I think they just wanted that to go away. I don't think they really cared whether we brought it or whether someone else did. They just were tired of being caught in the middle of it. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's what somebody told me because they wanted to kill me and didn't want to say that, but that's the feedback we kind of got. Well, where so. where did you operate from? Were you at a forward operating base? or We operated out of Camp Baharia, which was a small base adjacent to Camp Fallujah, which was much larger. But we were on this uh, outcrop area, and um, we operated out of there, but I we weren't there very much. Um, I mean, maybe 50% of the time and the other 50% we were out and sleeping where we were and doing things like that. And, um, you know, this was all, um, Operation Phantom Fury was part of what we did. And after that, we lived in a house off base for a long time. I, I want to say several months, but that might be rosy memory, but we were in a house for weeks, if not months. Uh, what was the security like in that area? If you were able to stay in a in a house, well, we we were the security. Yeah. Um, I you know I guess Phantom Fury, we the city was cleared out, and I don't think there was really anybody left in the city. And then after that, the idea was letting people back in the city, but searching them as they came in to try and keep the problems out and um, our little house was an outpost to on a roadway to, mo to you know to secure the roadways but then also to run a checkpoint as these people came back in so what your your house was really uh, like a combat outpost or, or? It, it ended up being that way it was uh, somebody who was um, a known um, you know insurgent or, or whatever that's what we were calling him at the time I guess um, whatever he was, he was known and apparently he was either gone or dead. So it was a vacant house that was large enough to sleep uh, a platoon of Marines. So um, our, at that point they split the whole company. We, we had the same area of operation, but we were company by, or platoon by platoon in different places throughout the area. So, so were the various platoons in the company assigned to different infantry battalions or? Well, no, all the platoons served uh, Apache Company. So there were okay. uh, first platoon, second platoon, third platoon, and then I was in the weapons platoon, and we had a headquarters platoon. So each... each so you maintained unit integrity right. as a company? Right. Okay. Our company was together the whole deployment. So we'd broken off our battalion in order to deploy, but once we were deployed, we, we were a cohesive unit for Can that you time. describe a typical day? Uh, I guess it depends on the day. Um, you know, I guess uh, before Phantom Fury, before the push into the city, um, our typical day was route security. My typical day was to go where I'm told pretty much. Um, I, I don't know if I would, just hadn't wrapped my head around the operations side of things yet or not, but um, you know, what we, rank were you at that time? I was a lance corporal. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I may have, I may have been a PFC, but I think by the time we deployed, I was a lance corporal, and um, you know, you pick up those ranks by, by breathing. So, um, but we um, did route security, and then we'd kind of get these odd, not oddball missions, but just it's almost like they didn't know what to do with them, so they gave them to us. If it had to do with driving a long way, that was sounded like a great assignment, I think, for a light armored reconnaissance battalion. So, um, you know, we'd go camp out on 
some road for five days for what I could tell was no foreseeable reason other than to be there, which is fine. Presence is important. But, um, you know, I didn't know what I was doing other than going where I was told to go. Um, Somebody had the big picture, but it, yeah, it was not me. Told you. No, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then, you know, I, we had a rough idea of when the invasion was going to be of the city. Um, and we actually did a lot of escorts for the PSYOPs guys who would drive their Humvees up to the edge of the city and broadcast the messages that, as I understand, because I don't understand the Arabic, but essentially said, you know, if you, if you want to be peaceful, you should split town because eventually we're going to come in. And um, so anyway, so all that led up to the push through the city and we kind of got our, our orders um, a week or two in advance to know what our role was going to be. And, um, you know, we, we'd done a lot of, we had spent a lot of time. We had a great uh, command structure. I, I had a uh, first sergeant I'll never forget. I think he's the best one I ran into in the Marine Corps just because he was tough as nails and, and treated us tough as nails. So it kind of made us, I think, behave better than I'd, other, I'd seen in other units in my time in. And, uh, and not, you know, nothing disparaging on those units either, but just that he wanted us to be sharp, disciplined, and well-trained. So, um, but we spent a lot of time doing house clearing training, you know, sort of urban combat, because we knew that that's, that was what was coming up. Um, but we got our orders for Phantom Fury. And I don't know if they were lying to us or, or telling us the truth, but I guess it doesn't matter. But um, they told us we weren't going to be going into the, the heart of the city because they weren't sure we could get the LAVs down the roads that we would need to get down. So um, our primary function was going to be to set up a, a screen line on, on the south side of the city. So as the, the infantry foot units pushed everyone through from the north that eventually, you know, those trying to retreat would run into us on the other side. Okay. So we were, um, you know, we were watching the back door, I guess. I thought your comment was interesting when you said that uh, whoever the, the senior uh, leadership thought there might be difficulty with the LAVs in the city. Was it because of narrow roads? or I think it was because of narrow roads. And uh, the reason I say I don't know whether they're lying or telling the truth is I know that tanks are rolling through the city. Okay. And last time I checked, they're bigger than an LAV. <laughs> But I think that um, they didn't want an LAV blocking the way for the tanks, maybe, or if they, they theorized that they were using us, it would be in a place where we wouldn't fit. Um, or it may have been our captain couldn't get the job for us and was, was sad about it, so he made up a lie. Or he wanted to avoid the job and made up a lie. I, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I understand. It's all irrelevant after the fact. I just, but, yeah. um, you know, I can remember... Um, blessing or a curse it was it, it felt a little rotten to have put so much effort into being ready for that and then to, to not do that but um, we had our little screen line and then you know we'd get these little cleanup missions like I said you know we're, we could get somewhere fast so all these little outlier buildings around the city we um, got sent to a lot of those to go clear them out kind of like a reaction team or a reaction force. yeah we were really good at that kind of stuff I mean or at least tasked with that type of stuff a lot. Not not too much QRF, quick response force, quick reaction force, but um, but just a lot of, you know, I don't know, somebody looked at a map and said there's a cluster of houses over here, but we don't want to make anybody walk there, so why don't you go drive there and clear out the houses? Um, you know, the guys on foot in the city, I know we're going building to building and house to house in terms of crossing a street to do that, but ours always seem to involve a drive in between to get from place okay. to place, which you know, maybe maybe that was the bigger picture is that it was better to use us that way than to tie us up in the city and then have nobody to deal with these little, you know, gas station here, building yeah. there, whatever. So, was uh, was fuel difficult to come by? Um, I don't. Not for us. No, we we'd always have a. You know, I. Uh, command structure was smart enough to build in getting gas when we needed it. So there was always fuel depots on base. So we just knew after a certain amount of time we had to be back at base to refuel. So we never had any issues. I can't, uh, I guess I, there were times we 
had fuel trucks come to us too, so, or uh, to meet somewhere in between. So. Did, did you live on MREs or how frequently <laughs> would you get a hot meal? Um, so we, we, you know, whenever we were on, on base, we'd get a hot meal. Um, and we were on base often enough. And then uh, a lot of MREs, but you know, you quit eating those after a while. You'd rather go hungry than eat an MRE. Um, when we were living in our house, it was a little ragtag in terms of we had the MREs, but most people were cooking for themselves at that point. Or um, we were near a, call it a meat factory, but it was a meat processing plant. And I guess it was right inside of our, our control point. But, um, you know, for the locals, it was a business. So we had come to an agreement with them to let them run their workers and to keep, keep the plant running. And, you know, I think we were just trying to be good, good to them, knowing that they weren't trying to get all the way into the city. And, you know, we had units between on the other side of them. So if they, I, it was a very controllable situation for us to let them work the plant. But I think they were pleased enough about it that we got a lot of food from them that was, you know, fresh local food versus something that's been in a bag for two years before you open it. So. Were, were you able to communicate with the folks in the area you were yeah. situated in? I mean, they spoke enough English and we either had a translator or could use hand signals or, and I, I knew, I knew very, very bad uh, Arabic at the time, but um, it was enough to communicate. It, I mean, we weren't, we weren't discussing Shakespeare, but in terms of I need you to move your car or, you know, whatever this case might be, we could get by. What so. wh what did you use for currency for interactions with uh Um you know, money. Well, money always worked. Um US dollars US or dollars. NPC, military payments or something? Yeah, um US dollars. Okay. Um I wanna say cigarettes, but I probably wasn't willing to trade those away at the time. Um, you know, whatever we could use. I, I didn't trade for too much, but, um, you know, anything American that we had might be a good, right. something to, to trade. But um, there there wasn't too much that they had that I wanted so badly that I'd give it all away. But, you know, a, do a dollar could buy you a, enough to eat for a day. So as far as they were, you know, you give them a dollar, they'll give you all the food you want. So... Um, but, you know, bartering when we had to. Yeah. So I, I had uh, enough good friends stateside sending me cartons of American cigarettes that uh, I could trade with other Marines, you know, with those. But, uh, you know, a, a lot of guys were smoking the, the local cigarettes <coughs> that you get for $2 a carton and they fall apart and you just hope it's tobacco that's inside. So, but, um, yeah. Were there, were there any times when you were particularly concerned for your safety or security? Um, you know, it's so, uh, it was such a flexible feeling, I, I think. I, like I said, when we first went in country, I was terrified and I shouldn't have been. And I, I know that now. And then there were times when I should have been terrified for my life that I wasn't because by that point things were so intense that what was dangerous seemed mundane. Um, you know, I can remember, I think the 10th day or 11th day that we were of, of the siege of the city, that things were, it was so commonplace to be shot at or whatever else that, you know, bullets hitting the ground nearby wasn't really a big deal. But, um, you know, if that was happening right now to me in, in Atlanta, I'd, I'd probably worry about that. But I guess 23 and in the middle of a war zone, I didn't care so much. Um, when you were inside the vehicle, could you hear rounds plinking against the side? Um, I never heard it on the vehicle I was in. I'm sure you would, um, but I, it never, never occurred with with me. Um, uh, I guess the, you know, LAVs are pretty thick, but I, they won't stop too much. They'll stop some small arms fire, but they wouldn't stop much else. So. Um, you know, I don't know if we got, maybe I wasn't paying attention and we got shot, but I don't remember hearing anything from the inside about that. Um, I did, I, I did end up, uh, I was wounded, um, and really, uh, it came down to 
a situation that probably should have been one of those where I knew I was in danger but didn't care. Uh, we were kind of 10th, 11th day of the siege and uh, we got the order. We'd been sleeping in our gear whenever we could sleep. So and it was only kind of an hour here, an hour there. But it was the first night where they said, you know, this is a night where you can sleep. So lay down and sleep. You don't need to wear your gear. You can get a full six hours, four hours, whatever, whatever seemed amazing at the time. And um, so I got to sleep on the ground and I got to take my gear off. And so I did. And it was, I remember it being the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, but I had a shift coming up to, to stand watch and I had gotten up to get ready for watch and was uh, kind of standing outside the vehicle and hadn't decided not to put my gear on yet because I didn't think or care about being in danger and had a indirect fire rocket land right next to me and uh, you know caught some shrapnel in, in my head and my arm and you know probably would have been all right if I'd had a helmet on but you know. Were you evac'd? Uh, I, yeah, I was. I needed to go get checked out at least. Um, you know, I guess I would have stayed if that would have been my only option, but since it's an option to get taken back, that's what they wanted to do with us. And, um, and actually the whole the whole crew on my vehicle had uh, ended up being wounded to one degree or another from it. Um, you know, I guess the intensity of it is that I, I can remember, well, I obviously remember it very clearly, but I remember was standing there with my buddy and uh, our crew and we were smoking smoking cigarettes again and um, I can remember him him asking me where he said uh, they were firing they'd been firing artillery over our heads all day uh, us firing right. artillery over our own heads and they were using um, wrap rounds rocket assisted projectiles so you'd hear the cannons fire and then you'd hear the rockets kind of launch them further and, and uh, I, can remember my, I can remember my buddy saying, is that another rocket? And then I, I don't remember what happened next, but I can remember being in the explosion. And I, you know, the only way I can really describe it well is uh, that uh, as far as my memory was concerned when it happened is that I didn't remember anything before that. Because the only thing that mattered, I guess, was what was in the moment. Because I'm sure that's what your brain does when you're in that kind of situation, but I didn't remember thinking about a rocket. I just remember being in an explosion. And, uh, and I kind of wasn't sure what was going on. I couldn't see because of the dust. And uh, my, my gut reaction was to kind of dive back into the vehicle, which you know probably would have been great a minute before and not a minute after. But um, I dove back in and the, the buddy of mine I'd been smoking with, I, I, could, I could hear him screaming and I could hear my vehicle commander talking to me from inside the vehicle. And I thought he'd been in the vehicle. And I learned later he'd been standing up and had gotten pretty well peppered. But I, I couldn't tell at the time. But he was asking if everybody was all right. And uh, I kind of, you know, checked myself and felt my, my body and thought I was fine. And said, well, isn't that a relief? And then had a bunch of blood start pouring off my head. And I said, well, OK, I guess I thought too soon. But uh, and it didn't hurt bad, and I put my hand up there and could tell I still had a skull. So I said, well, mm. you know, I'm just bleeding, so I'll be all right. But um, my friend who was screaming was a real good friend, and he was it's kind of a, um, a terrible scream. So I ran over trying to find him, and when I found him, he was sitting down on the ground, and he had a, a pretty good cut on, on the back of his head, but he settled down. He said, okay, I guess I'm all right. Maybe I overreacted a little bit, but I can remember being really relieved that I wasn't going to have to, you know, talk, so did, talk did all, to his family or did anything. Did all about. those injured, did all the Marines who were injured survive? Yeah, they did. And, uh, you know, I think once I got a good grasp on what was wrong with me, I just tried to direct attention to other people because, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I wasn't feeling great, but I wasn't in a lot of pain or anything mm -hmm. like that. It sounds like once you got past the shock, and you yeah. started, your awareness just kicked in. Yeah, and uh, you know, I can remember I sort of waffled at the back of the vehicle because I couldn't decide whether, like I said, we had a tough first sergeant who said, don't ever leave your weapon behind. And so I kind of decided that we we would bolt, or not bolt, but um, 
bungee strap the rifles into the vehicle just to keep them from bouncing around too much. But whenever we'd leave, we'd take them with us. And uh, I think I turned around three or four times trying to decide whether I needed to take my rifle with me when I went to go see my check on my buddy because I was also worried about our first sergeant chewing me out for leaving my rifle with the vehicle. But uh, but anyway, no, I, the, uh, the vehicle commander had been peppered pretty good, but I think it was all very shallow and uh, and he was he ended up being fine but but certainly looked the most dramatic um, of what, anybody. Was it was it an artillery round or you said a it rocket? It was a rocket round. It was an indirect fire rocket we found out and um, you know 122 millimeter and I guess you that's, light it. That's a fairly big. And it goes up and it comes back down so it's it's like a mortar but it's a rocket powered. Yeah, but it's that's a fairly big round. Yeah and I think um, we probably got lucky that it, I think it buried itself a little bit before it detonated and, um, you know, I'll uh, certainly always be glad that, that that's what, uh, what fate had in store for us. But, where, uh, where, did, where did they evacuate? We where, have how to, many of the crew were evacuated? All, everybody was. So we okay. left, and uh, what, was, what we were used to seeing is whenever they'd blow up uh, one of our, around one of our LIVs, like you said, they're air, air inflated tires, it would either overpressure the tires or the shrapnel would just puncture the tires. So every time we had an explosion, we'd have eight flat tires, which takes a little while to change those things. So we, they loaded us up in the back of another vehicle and, um, and drove us just back to Camp Fallujah. And I, I can remember it being really, I mean, it was, the medical center was busy. There were a lot of wounded and a lot of dead at the time from the, from the siege. Um, so I'm sure they triaged us as pretty simple fixes and sent us all to the, a tent on the outside and we were treated there. Um, you know, one of our guys, I can remember the, uh, my buddy who was hit in the head, or the third guy in our crew had a little dot on his hand where he'd been hit. And I, I can remember the, you know, I guess the irony of how these things happen is, you know, we saw him with his little dot on his hand and we said, well, lucky you, you know, SOB, why don't you get out of here? Tired of seeing you. And, uh, and he's the one who got sent home because he's the one who had an injury that, I guess, that it right? hit a ligament or something like that. And he couldn't use his hand without going home. And the rest of us all went right back out where we were supposed to go. So, you know, the, the ones you think are the worst are the best. The ones you think are the best are the worst. So, what, Was there a corpsman with your... Uh... Yeah, we had corpsman. Um, I can't remember if they rode with us in the vehicle or not. They probably were paying more attention to the guy for vehicle commander. Um, you know, he... Seemed, he, I think, lost a lot of blood and not an emergency, but certainly a lot more concerning. You know, we put on, they put a head wrap on me and my buddy to where, you know, I think that the, we were pretty well under control. It was just a matter of stitches or whatever else they wanted to do. But, um, you know, I think it was a little less controllable with some other, with his injuries. So, um, and I don't know when we got there in the, ho in the hospital tent, I can remember the, uh, to, to my disappointment, um, I can remember we got there, you know, this is all, infantry is all, all male units, so we really didn't see a lot of women. And two of the uh, workers in the hospital tent were these two young blonde nurses, and uh, I thought that that was fantastic. And um, so my, my buddy was on the bed, and he had his little cut, and They'd kind of taken his, he had, we wore flight suits, that's what we, as mm -hmm. crewmen, so they had, you know, half removed his flight suit and were washing him down and telling him how sorry they were for him. And I thought, oh, this is great, but, you know, he's married. And then um, this chief naval chief uh, corpsman came out, and he was, you know, 250 pounds with a mustache, and he's the one who was scrubbing me down. And I said, you know, this really doesn't seem fair to me that... Uh, this should probably be a role reversal for his marriage's <laughs> sake and for my lack of one. But, uh, um, they, you know, I, we were we were one of so many. I can remember they, they had a doctor come out and look at me, and the chief kept cleaning me up. And she said, you know, just wash them off and get them out of here. So he said, okay, and he kind of scrubbed me up a little more. And he said, you know, I think I'm going to go get the doctor back out here to take a second look. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, because I'm looking at your skull. I said, okay. It sounds like we should do something about that. So I think it was, you know, an oversight among things that are probably a lot more substantial than a cut on my head. But um, they ended up, she came back out and agreed with him. And so I got some stitches there. And um, 
So when when you were were you released to return to your unit from the from the emergency <laughs> they, situation there? They had uh, they had to stay in a in a, an observation room for the night. Um, really, I think they just didn't want to cart us back to our base, and we couldn't get back with our unit at the time. So they just they had a bed for us to stay in. Um, and we stayed there, and then they got us back over to our uh, primary camp, but um, they were kind of in headquarters mode, so there was a lot of standing post on an inactive base. So within, I think, the second day, I found my way onto a vehicle to go back out, whether they wanted me or not. Um, I ended up having to go back later because I got a nice infection from okay. putting a helmet back on right away and leaving it on. I, I think the idea, I thought, was that I'd have time to take it off, but um, we'd gotten moved from where we had been to somewhere else that was uh, a lot more intense and there was no time or opportunity to take take a helmet off so it was just festering in there. And um, Where in your tour was this? Halfway through? It's probably halfway. halfway. Sort of in November time frame. So, okay. well, not even halfway yet. Um, but that's kind of when things were most intense. And you, you asked about hot chow. We hadn't had a hot chow in a while and the place we went after that was so awful that I think we were up there a week, and I can remember just being, you know, living off the of MREs and whatever we could get our hands on. And I can remember the, uh, there were, we, for whatever reason, they picked a dump, a, a, a literal dump as our, our outpost. So the flies were so bad that uh, I had fly tapes, which, and I mm -hmm. hung them up outside, which I knew wouldn't do any good, but it was a little science experiment. And within 30 minutes, the fly tapes were so full of flies that the flies weren't sticking to the fly tape. And, um, but anyway, after it had been a few days, they decided to bring us in hot chow. And thought it was great. And so we were all waiting on the truck and I, I, maybe we were, maybe we weren't, but I feel like we were cheering for the food truck as it came in. And, um, and they blew up the trailer of the food truck on the way in. All the hot chow got blown up and the army guys that were bringing it in, and they carted them off. They're, they were fine, but the truck was out of commission and the food was gone. I can remember the disappointment. That, uh, I can imagine. You know, we, they were bringing us eggs and sausage and whatever else you get, and we were all tasting it, but then uh, we were eating MREs again, so. Um, and that, that area was, I, you know, I said that uh, I wasn't sure they knew how to use LAVs, and I don't think that area was the best place for us to be in because we're big, big vehicles in a stopped position in the middle of a really dangerous area where it right. probably is better to have guys that are just on foot just in terms of smaller targets and, and easier to get out of there if you got to get out of there we were, we kind of felt like sitting ducks with did, um, did your uh, uh, vehicle ever fire on targets oh uh, yeah we did we fired a lot on target um structures or structures uh, I don't think I ever took a shot on any vehicles, which, um, you know, the irony is that's the purpose of the weapon. We never yeah. had vehicles to fire on. Um, I know the, you know, we'd set up with the different vehicles in the unit for their different weapon systems, and, you know, we, I know we're sitting on the screen line. We put a lot of rounds on, on targets trying to come out the backside of the city. Um, our mortar crews actually during the invasion were used like a uh, the artillery units were at the time. I think they fired constantly for a week or so, just that they were getting fire missions from units in the city um, and around the city. So they were busy. What do you remember? What infantry units were in the city? Um, you know, I make, I'll make people mad if I get it wrong. I know 3-5 uh, Dark Horse was okay. a unit that was there and did a lot. And uh, and this is where I'll apologize in advance for not knowing my history, but it's uh, it was either 3-1 or 1-3, I think, was okay. there. Um, and I, you know, the what what caused me heartache was not being in the city, but it it's a blessing, too, because those guys got, you know, that was hard for them. Yeah. You know, they lost a lot of guys there. So we... The benefit to us was, you know, we sure we missed out on the mission, but, uh, you know, we didn't. You're here. We're here. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so your tour was how long? We did seven months. Seven months, okay. So after that, we did, 
is when we lived in the house and sort of funneled people back in the city and a lot of real low key stuff. Um, we'd kind of we'd get a lot of harassing, fire, you know, nothing we took too seriously. I guess would be a way of putting it. You know, we'd get shot at and we'd care, but what the intensity level was much lower. And then um, you know we did some some wrap up missions. Um, trying to get people who had somehow gotten out of the city or who weren't there to begin with but were a problem um, in some of these suburban cities. I, I, they weren't really suburban, but just outlier cities mm -hmm. to Fallujah. And then, uh, and then we went back to route security, really. And we finished up our, our deployment there. And I, I can remember, um, you know, things were getting a lot more intense with the roadside bombs. I think what changed with those is they started just upping the caliber that they were using, mm -hmm. where, uh, or you know, wouldn't caliber, but they'd go to just a larger artillery shell or a larger, multiple artillery shells to to deal with whatever uh, we had to put against what they had. So if if they were detonating mortar rounds for a roadside bomb because the Humvees in the area had the the paper doors, mm -hmm. and then we showed up in LAVs, well, they would just change to a higher size bomb. Did any of the uh, vehicles in your company where they uh... we didn't have any catastrophic kills okay. on our vehicle we had um, you know the end of our deployment was back to route security and I can remember the sentiment of the whole unit was just to get through it um, mm -hmm. we we had we had not lost anybody in our unit we had wounded go home a couple um, but we we hadn't lost anyone and I think the time you know whether we whether it was a good assessment or a bad one, I think everybody was afraid that doing route security again was the best way to lose somebody before we went home, and uh, and we didn't we didn't lose anybody. But I I think the time was stressful for everybody. That uh, you know I think you feel like you make it through so much it would be a really right. nasty feeling to lose somebody on the simplest what feels like the most mundane and simplest job. But when, when you're talking about route security, was that just driving down the road? We would just drive up and down the road looking for roadside bombs to, and clearing it for convoys. And so you find them the hard way and you find them the easy way. And uh, um, for that deployment, that was, the, that was the, you know, it wasn't too stressful. We didn't do it that much. And... Um, I don't think anybody tried to make the plans really complex. So we really, it just meant we were driving a local convoy over and over again. We'd drive up and down the same road and stop and watch. And, but you know, nothing too complicated. Just just unsafe yeah. is what, uh, what it was. Well, the unknown, you right. never know. Right, yeah. So, but uh, that was pretty much my first deployment. And then we came home on April Fool's Day and I, wasn't sure until we got on the plane whether it was a joke or not. Um, but uh, came home, and I remember uh, remember getting home. That was good. It, it's funny. I felt like the plane ride there took a few minutes because I didn't want to be on it, and the plane ride back took a couple of days because I wanted to get there faster. So it's funny how that works. Um, came home. You know, I think. Uh, I can remember, so, you know, they, they won't tell you what, what day you're coming home. And both both my parents were still working at the time. And um, this is back to the good old differences between moms and dads. When we got to Kuwait, I called called home and said, uh, you know, we're coming home soon. And uh, I don't, don't know when it's going to be, but it'll probably be in the next few weeks. My old man said, that's fantastic. And then, uh, I you know, we were going to come home and they make you sit down for a couple of weeks before you, they even let you go to your real home. So that's fine. You'll get here. It'll be great. You can call us, and then we'll see you in a couple of weeks when you drive home. And my mother said, you let me know as soon as you know what day it's going to be, and I'm going to be there. So the, the difference between what they needed to fee, be satisfied was completely different. And, um, you know, I, I don't know how much warning I got to give her or what. I don't even think maybe we didn't give her any at all. I think she had to check a website or something. And, um, so I was kind of expecting her. I wasn't expecting anybody, and then all of a sudden I was expecting her. And then uh, when I remember when I got off the bus, she wasn't there. She was running late. And apparently, weather 
whether she's telling it right or not, she was driving 120 miles an hour down North Carolina highways <laughs> and uh, earning a few speeding tickets trying to get to it. So, um, but she got there within a few minutes um, after, and I know she was uh, <laughs> ecstatic to see me. And I could tell I'd, uh, I'd given her a tick in her eye while I was away. She didn't have it when I left, but she, you know, she kind of had a jumpy yeah. eye when I got off the bus. So um, made me feel a little bit bad about it. But uh, but it was good to be home. I mean, so how yeah. long were you there? Um, there in country? In uh, no, in camp when you came back. To uh, camp you know, they make you. They sort of quarantine you, and I think it's mental and physical. They don't want you to spread any diseases, but they and they want to make sure you settle down. Um, and then I think it was a week or two before they let us go venture out in the world. I mean, we were you could go off base or do whatever yeah. else, but they wanted to make sure that every morning you were waking up there and every night you were going to sleep there. So, um, you know, it, it was a couple weeks, and then took a big chunk of leave and went home for a couple weeks and you know like all good marines after a couple weeks at home it's restless to get back and you know then you get back and you don't know why but uh um spent some spent the time there and then went back to the unit and um you know things kind of pan out from there where there's not really a lot going on a lot of guys are done with their service times so they're getting out so the units start shrinking and then um Guys like me who were, who had plenty of time left, they want to get you out to a unit that's going to deploy, mm. not too quick, but they don't want you to sit around too long either. So um, they moved me from uh, a Alpha Company, Apache Company, over to Delta Company, who was they were working up for another deployment and they were going to leave in seven months, and um, so I got sent over there to work up with them and uh, spent a little while there but not too long, and then um, 2nd Tank Battalion has infantry units attached to them that are tow gunners mm -hmm. and machine gunners to run CAT teams, which are the combined anti-tank teams. And, um, and apparently they had a shortage of, you know, 40 people, some, some, you know, it's one platoon, it's supposed to be 30, 40 or 50 people all together, and they were somehow short 40 or 50 people, so I don't know where how they thinned out like that, but uh, um, our battalion got the call that they were short. So you know, the interesting thing was half our guys stayed in Alpha Company and half the guys went to Delta Company, but then all the guys went over to Tobleton. So it was a little bit nice to get reunited with some guys. Hmm. Um, but we got sent over to Second Tanks to be in one of their their platoons and um, so the tow in the tank battalion was mounted. It's mounted on a hum Humvee in the tank battalion. Okay. So, um, but you know, again, I I guess my first deployment we actually used tow missiles, and then in my second one, I don't even think we had one mounted on a vehicle. We were all just down to machine guns and and whatever else. But there's there's not a lot a lot of need for an anti-tank missile when there's no no tanks or armored vehicles and and it made sense uh on our first deployment to have use of them but um on the second one I don't know if uh it would have made any sense for us to have them on the vehicles and and we didn't so um so anyway I'd gone over to tows and or tow platoon and worked up with them and deployed with them and when was uh, when was that? When was that, the second deployment? Let's see. We left. It was the opposite end of the year, so the first deployment was in the winter, and it was it was uh, it was cold. It was awfully cold, and I remembered hating the cold. And then the second deployment was a summer deployment, so I think we left in March or April, and came back in November. So we spent the whole summer, in, uh, in and it was in Fallujah again. So you know see the world. I saw the same city twice. Um, but our whole mission for my second deployment was route security. Mm -hmm. So uh, much, much different mission. You know, we'd come home every night to the base and sleep on base and go back out the next day and our, our shift would cycle around where sometimes we'd have the night shift and sometimes the day shift, but it all, you know, I think we had a couple of three-day missions throughout the entire deployment. And other than that, it was always coming home and going back out. And um, sometimes I wonder which was easier, just 
living out there or yeah. having to start over every day. Well, was it a high stress, low stress situation? I mean, you, you were talking about root, you know root reconnaissance and yeah. high stress, and then you're back and you're take your pack off for the night, and then you know the stress level ramps back up. I think that was kind of it with the entire second deployment. Was it's every day you got to sort of make the jump to go outside the wire, which um, you know. I, I liked that, I liked doing that, but sometimes taking the leap every day, I think, would wear, it, it just kind of drains you. Um, and and really, you know, we were out there driving around and, and getting, you know, we'd find a lot of roadside bombs and we'd find a lot by looking at them, but we found a lot by getting hit by them too. Um, you can't find them all. And uh, and this is before the, the big MRAP vehicles yeah. and we weren't in tanks, we were just in, at least it was the thick-skinned Humvees, but um, it it didn't feel good. You know, we had guys get shaken up, and I somehow managed to escape getting blown up this deployment. But um, our you know our our little columns would driving around our sections, and uh, you know we'd just run up and down the 50-mile stretch of highway with four Humvees for eight hours. In many of the documentaries about um, the Iraq conflict. Um, there's a lot of video of U.S. vehicles driving down a road and being approached by at high speed by some uh, small POV, privately mm. owned vehicle. Mm. Did you run into that situation? Um, you know, we've we'd I mean we'd have those situations where we'd have somebody coming at us. Um, sometimes we, you know, I guess it depends on how we would how the situation would would arise um the the whole because we knew we were going to be doing this for an entire seven month period we really tried to shake it up as much as we could so if um and sometimes we'd choose to drive the wrong way down the highway um you know that that sounds sort of lunatic and, and suicidal but uh the, these are big open highways and by that point everybody was kind of used to what went on so if we were driving head-on people would slow down and pull off the highway knowing to let us make or make way for us um, and and you could kind of see some people would be a little bit caught by surprise but it was never an issue of somebody getting too close and having to make decisions on right. what to do um, I think we encountered I if, among our platoon we had a couple of suicide vehicle attempts and um, that I can recall I think one detonated when he was too far away and wasn't even up on the road yet and I think it caught the unit by surprise because they don't know why he detonated early I you know it made me think that maybe he wasn't the one holding the trigger but somebody mm -hmm. watching him was and probably misjudged and you know what a what a waste of that guy's life to not even do it right, but um, you know, we encountering vehicles was usually not the problem. It was just the nuisance right. of the roadside bombs, and then um, the the cleverness towards the end of our deployment because we had so many countermeasures to the roadside bombs was they were packing uh, MRE bags with um, C4 and a simple pressure switch, and it's almost like I would almost. You know, I know, I know my history to know that the landmines in Vietnam, they weren't about killing anybody, they are about crippling the unit. You know, blow somebody's leg off, you cripple the unit. And um, that was essentially what these were doing, is we'd hit them with a Humvee and it'd blow the whole engine block out of the Humvee, and everyone in the vehicle would be foreseeably fine, but now you're sitting in the middle of the highway with a half a Humvee, and so you have to stop whatever you're doing just to get back. And it was just a, it was an equipment attack right. and uh, you know it's, it was something we didn't see and then when we saw it that's all we saw you know because it worked I'm yeah, sure it was successful. so yeah. um, we saw a lot of that and then that you know we kind of just you know, I think that deployment was very much a, a head down foot forward just trying to just counting the days and getting it over with um, there, there was no there was no you know I'm I'm glad we could keep the roads clear, but the the excitement there was no there was less joy to take from that in terms of um, doing something exhilarating. It was just kind of taking a risk every day, 
to get something done. Mm. And, um, you know, towards the end of that deployment, um, you know, I took, took fewer chances with myself because I just wasn't interested in doing that for, mm. um, when I didn't have to. So we would, you know, drive around in vehicles and when we'd stop, it's a great opportunity to stretch your legs, but uh, I wasn't interested in, in getting out anymore for right. no reason. No reason to get shot right. for nothing. So, um, and, and um, you know, I think we kind of got assigned to what we were doing and then forgotten and just left to do that, which, uh, you know, it's a job that has to get done. I, I certainly understand that, but uh, sort of had lost, lost the Marine feel to it. And right. We were just sort of in the area. and it's Just routine. Yeah, routine and, and more of a static sort of occupation type deal. And um, So you were ready to go when your rotation date came, right? Yeah, um, I was really ready to go. And um, sadly, uh, our last day on deployment was when uh, w when our our platoon lost somebody. Um, and he was, we were doing changeover with the unit coming in behind us and he was just out on a, you know, a buddy escort with them to help them through the ropes. And, uh, and he got shot uh, in the side. He was shot between his, the plates on his vest and um, you know I think it was one of those things where you know people I, yeah, I guess you get a little grotesque when you're in but people get hurt and sometimes seriously hurt but you kind of have a feeling when they're gonna get through it or not and I think that uh, you know I only heard from word of mouth but uh, I assumed from the description that he that it wasn't uh, something to worry about I mean, you know, you care about their health and you hope that things go right, but it seemed like a situation for things to go right, and uh, and it didn't. And he, you know, we kind of got uh, a little bit of a warning when uh, they said it wasn't looking good, and then, you know, and then they came back and told us he was gone, and it was uh, quite a big uh, How thing. much time had transpired between the time he was shot and you knew that he was gone? Uh, maybe eight hours. Okay. I think he was, I can remember I was in the, you know, I was jovial. I'd done, I was done with my last run and I was in the, I can remember being in the chow hall on base getting some food and it was lunchtime and uh, I heard about it and I can remember, uh, you know, kind of tongue in cheek talking about how, uh, you know, making a joke about it that, uh, you know, what a what a what a day to find a bullet kind of yeah. thing, and uh, not you know it sounded like it was going to be all right. And I guess um, I, I guess I have a rough sense of humor, but I I also understand that you know jokes don't hurt people. So I I, I don't regret making the joke, but I can remember that was my attitude was that uh, again not something to worry about. And then uh, I think it was around six or seven they told us things weren't looking good, and then. Um, it was within a few hours, and I, you know, I don't know if he died a couple hours before, and it was just making its just way to us, or or what. But um, we were at Camp Fallujah, and they'd flown him to um, Al Assad to hopefully repair him surgically. And um, I think he, he either died on the way there, or died when he was there. And um, you know, it's a shame to to one to have that happen to 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 him, and I, you know, he's just. A, a, one, you know, one of the friends that I had in the unit, and then the other part of it being that, uh, you know, we were all trying to be excited about going home, and um, that really kind of kills the mood. Yeah. You know, how long, how much more time did you spend in country before you flew out? Not long. I mean, I think we were home. We didn't drive out. We we uh, caught helicopters within the next couple of days down to Kuwait and the, or. Uh, to Baghdad and then flew by uh, C-130 to Kuwait and then commercial charters from Kuwait. So I can remember being home within uh, within a couple of days. The, did days. you fly into Cherry Point? Oh yeah, you fly into Cherry, Cherry Point. Point. That's that's in North Carolina. Yeah, yeah. There's um, I I don't know the the routes and I'm sure they keep changing them up. But it's uh, you know, they just charter whatever airliner will charter a jet to them and they. You go over with a few stops on the way with uh, nothing more than refueling and refooding, and then they 
get you back up again. So I, you know, all my life's extensive travel have been on those charter jets going over there. All my uh, my international experience. Were you able to tell your parents or communicate with him and when you were going to arrive? Or? They really don't want you to, and I okay. can't remember again on the second deployment whether they cared less or I cared less or if they told him. But um, you know, I remember being real careful the first time and and not telling them and letting them find out however way they naturally find out. And then the second time, I might have given them a. a rough timeline but you know you don't really know either where they yeah. they kind of give you a window but um you know i think it's your cargo at that point so if uh if you get on this plane or that plane they don't care you're you're a piece of uh i mean they, you know your not cargo. in a heartless way that you're a piece but of cargo, cargo but you're on a list of things to go and right. when, when you go you go so um but i think that time uh, they were both there when we got home that time, and uh, and I can remember it being daytime, and they didn't have any problem getting there. So I think it was a little, a little more predictable that time around. I, I think what they might have measured out is that the flight flights from Kuwait didn't matter so much as the flights uh, out of country that they didn't want to, you know, have get found out. But um, yeah. it's not like they're going to be waiting for you at Cherry Point either. So. Um, so when you went back to Second Marine Division, and, uh, I did, and um, and really I got back there, and um, same sort of experience as the first time around. There was a decent gap between my deployments to where it was apparent that I wasn't going to deploy a third time from the timing. So uh, people that were going to deploy went one direction, and people that weren't went another. And um, I can remember we stayed with Second Tank Battalion. And there was a group of maybe 20 or 30 guys that were going to all be out within an, a time when deploying made no sense, and uh, but making use of us did. So um, they stuck us in one place and made us a unit and said, your job is to, to train everybody else from this point on. And we, we were tasked with um, either to train the tankers on what to expect or to train the other infantry guys on what to expect. And... Uh, you know, like in the, uh, we're, we were a little bit riff-raffy, I think, you know, because we were all short-timers mm -hmm. at that point. So, uh, What we, rank were you at the time? I, I, when we, I was a corporal on our second deployment, and uh, I was a, I picked up sergeant the, okay. the week we got back. So I was a sergeant in that platoon, and we, we called ourselves the Star Platoon, which uh, uh, I couldn't have been more tongue-in-cheek since... Um, I'm pretty sure we were done paying any high respects to anybody or listening to what anybody told us to do. But uh, but we had a lot to offer. You know, we all the guys had a couple of combat tours at least, and um, and it all all just come off of a deployment. So you know, the th the thing that I seem to have observed, and I'm I know I'm not the first one, but it's that uh, the situations in Iraq and Afghanistan are so fluid that really. You know, if you know something from five years ago, that probably doesn't mean anything today. And um, so there was a big uh, benefit to having a group of people that could act as educators who had just come back to, to kind of fill them in yeah. or give them an idea what to expect. And, um, you know, telling the new guys to, while they might want to look tough and stand up in a tank turret, it's probably not such a great idea when you can just sit in. down and uh you have all that steel around you so um but you know so when did you leave the marine corps i got out in august of 07 um october would have been my eas date but i did uh i applied to georgia state university here in atlanta and got an early release for that i can't remember the rule anymore i think they'll give you three months and um you know, they knew I was done, and I, I had been admitted, so um, got out I, sometime in late August, and you know, still had my hair cut when I got to school. So it was uh, it was a pretty quick transition from out of the core to to into school, and um, uh, you know, I was just ready to be done. I think, mm -hmm. um, like all good short timers, it was some of the politicking that that got me out. I was just, uh, you know, I think that. What I kind of enjoyed about being in was 
was being a warfighter and and going through tough situations and and the things that come with it like like being dirty and and right. none of your buddies care and you know you smell like sewage and nobody cares and uh to have all that but then to have somebody tell you your haircut doesn't look right, right you know that wasn't uh that wasn't what i wanted to, to do forever so um what about life after the corps you, you mentioned you went to school uh it was pretty good you know i had a year i had that year after the second deployment really to a little less than a year but to reacclimate myself to regular society i was still in but you know starting to yeah make the mental changes that you need to make um i can remember some little things that carried on like uh i can remember being in a class at georgia georgia state and the kid answered his cell phone in the classroom and i wasn't the teacher but uh it took every ounce of willpower not to grab the phone out of his hand and you know smash it in front of him and <laughs> ask him what he's doing so um some of that was you know, it's not hard to get used to. You get used to a culture, and um, and you have an expectation for how people behave, and um, and it, it took a little while to get over that, and 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 only in a subconscious sense. You know, I I know better. I know that I don't expect the everyday everyday civilians to to get it, but um, but you still feel it. You still think it, and um, that you know some. Going to school was a joke at that point. I, you know, I, the first time I went to school, I told you I didn't think it was really working out for me and I needed to find something else. And then uh, my second trip to school to say, well, all right, so 16 hours of classes and 16 hours of homework, I'm, I'm still at 32 hours. This feels pretty good. I got the whole week to myself. So um, that that was a, a really easy transition. I, I, I had done not so great at Boston University in terms of um, my performance. And it was just, uh, it was, I was skated at Georgia State. It was just too easy to, it's not that the school work wasn't challenging, but it was just so much easier to, to rise to the challenge and, you know, study when I needed to study and, and do what I needed to do. And, uh, and I learned these little tricks like uh, going to class makes a difference, um, you know, so, um, you know, I, I think in that sense that life life after the core sometimes is uh, has been a lot easier. Um, it's not it's not really hard to push myself um, to do some things. Some some things can be hard because um, it's the mundane, and when the challenge isn't there, it, that that seems to be the challenge these days. Is uh, you know I don't I don't want to do the mundane. I I like to to tackle um, big things and to really push myself. So when I when I get in those situations, it's fun, but... Um, it sounds like you've had quite a change from your post high school. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if that guy exists anymore. Um, you know, somebody, I, I can remember, you get in all these, you have too much time on your hands when you're deployed and you sit there, you know, I can remember spending hours thinking about uh, how somebody looks uh, that, uh, you know, I don't even care how they look, but I've got that kind of time on my hands because um, deployments are so filled with boredom, really. And uh, I can remember during the first deployment, um, you know, it, it was it would have been 2004, and I can remember it was around Christmas time, and uh, you know, a year and a half before I was the same, sl you know, slacker kid who wasn't doing anything, but uh, but when I woke up on this. December day in the middle of Iraq, in the middle of a, a hotbed war zone, saying to myself, you know, how in the hell did I get here? How did that, how did me of then, because I still, you know, it's the same chain of thoughts. So how did I, how did that guy get here? How am I here? What am I doing here? And, um, you know, they, they always say that, uh, you know, it's so great, you know, and, and what a sacrifice to to lose your life for the country, and and that we look on that. But uh, part of how I started to think about it was, um, you know, we kind of all gave up our lives, at least in the sense that uh, that that the me before wasn't the me after. That uh, that that guy's gone. I mean, there's there's a lot that remains, but a lot of it's gone, for for better or for worse. So. I, so you you married. I married, yeah. I uh, I met a girl while I was at Georgia State, and uh, 
I, I uh, met her in a bar, just like you're supposed to. And, uh, and um, it was funny, you know, I, I hadn't planned on meeting anybody and uh, was happy to be, at, you know, be out of the Marine Corps. And, uh, but I was well, well happy enough too to be a little bit locked away in my head and, and content with that, and um, like any good Marine. But this girl at the bar just wouldn't leave me and my buddy alone trying to play darts. And uh, so I started talking to her. And uh, the the great story on meeting her is I'm, I'm no dart wizard, but uh, I'd played some darts. And uh, like all good Marines, too, I was talking trash a little bit. So she hit a bullseye, and I said, that's great. And then, you know, good for you. And then she said, well, why don't you guys come talk to me and my friends? And I said, uh, well, you know, we're, we're playing cricket. If you know darts, you try to hit sequences in, of, uh, of each of the top numbers. And I said, well, we're not going anywhere until we're done with this game. She said, well, what has to happen for you to be done with the game? I said, well, I got to hit three bullseyes. She said, oh, okay, so probably never. And I said, well, hold on. And lucky enough, I threw three bullseyes right in a row. And uh, I just turned and looked at her and said, well, I guess we're coming to talk to you now. But, you know, played it cool like I meant right. to do that. So, right. Um, but started talking to her and, and, you know, didn't plan to make anything of it. But I said, well, what do you do? She said, well, I'm in school. And I said, well, where are you in school? And she said, I'm at Georgia State. I said, really, what are you studying? She said, psychology, which is what I was studying. So I said, well, you know, I haven't seen you in my classes. And uh, it was just kind of one of those connections to realize that uh, here's somebody I met in a random place, but we're doing the same things and didn't even realize it. So... Uh, you know, that took its course of seeing each other in class and kind of liked her. So, uh, so yeah, we got married in um, 2011, and we've got a, a little boy now who's uh, a little kid. And, uh, probably the biggest challenge of my life. Some, sometimes, uh, sometimes the war is easier than yeah. what, uh, what a two-year-old can put you through, but... Uh, but definitely a rewarding, you know. Great, congratulations. After, after life, yeah. So we're we're coming close to the end of this, but sure. we always give the interviewee an opportunity to kind of editorialize. Sure. Anything you want to say, any comments, your perspective on then, now, whatever. It's free time. Okay. I mean, um, you know, I don't really have. Uh, too much to it, I think. You know, I think that hasn't already been said by somebody else. I think that um, I think a lot of people went through things that are a lot harder than me, and um, and I think I went through some things that were a lot harder than other people. You know, I think it's all it's all relative. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, and I certainly don't want to take away from either of those groups. But uh, I was happy to do what I did, and I did what I did for for the people around me you know that's the the old story but it's uh it's completely true because i think that uh once you're there i don't think anything else matters i don't think the politics matter i don't think that um you know some some of the emotions even go away and it's just about um looking out for each other on the ground and um you know some of those guys i'm sure i could call them today and uh They'd, they'd be here in a minute. So, do you ever communicate with them? Or absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I keep up. Uh, I have a small core group of friends who, um, they're they're mostly guys that um, deployed with me both times. So they floated okay. to the same unit changes that I did. Um, but we try to get together once a year, and now now everybody's you know old and out of shape and <laughs> has kids and whatever else. But it's. Um, you know, I'm sure our wives are annoyed. We probably tell the same stupid stories every time we get together, but um, it's just great to see them. And, you know, there are guys I've talked to that I haven't talked to in 10 years, and then I, for whatever reason, make contact again, and it doesn't matter that I haven't seen them in 10 years. You know, I I think that's what uh, that's what I value the most. You know, I, I don't think you find that anywhere um, anywhere else. And, I mean, it's... It's the, uh, you know, they say uh, strength through adversity, but um, part of that strength, I think, is the strength of the relationship that you have with each other. That, um, you know, I've seen some, some 
terrible things and some hard things to deal with, but so have they, and, uh, and the same things, the exact same things. So um, I think that matters, and uh, it, you know, it makes Very it a, a lifetime connection. Yeah. So, well, I, I want to thank you for spending the time to tell uh, your story, and it also thank you for your service. It was a pleasure uh, doing the interview with you. So Absolutely. thank you. Of course. Thank you.